Um, all right. So uh, yeah, thanks uh, for the the invite. So looking at um, everyone who's sort of um, uh, sort of joined, there's a massive spectrum of of people um, from all sorts of different aspects of fluid. So I think um, it's probably a good decision to keep this a little bit broad, which is what I'm going to do. So at least at the first sort of third of the talk, roughly, I'll give a general overview um, of the. Um, oh, what's going on? There we go. Um, of uh, the sort of currently active research in the group. So um, most of the work that, that, that I work on. So essentially I'm gonna split that into the sort of what I call three focus areas, a bit of an overview on the fundamentals um, that we do here in, in two phase flows, a little bit more on the sort of applications. And then another area that um, we work on quite a bit as well is uh, technique development. So after talking about that, um, hopefully that won't take me too long I've sort of just chosen two little topics um, that I can delve into a little bit more. Um, the first one is on turbulent spray formation, uh, particularly with a focus there on looking at instability formation on, on the interface between a liquid jet and, and the surrounding uh, gas phase and what role that has on the formation of droplets downstream. It's a little bit of a fundamental problem. Um, and then I'll move on to some of the work that um, we've started doing really over the last two or three years on, on pharmaceutical aerosols and then sort of conclude. So in, in sort of focusing on the, on the broad overview first, in terms of fundamentals, um, there's a lot of uh, different aspects of two-phase flows um, that we work on. I would say the, the, main, the, the main ones that I'll talk about today are droplet and spray formation and um, also more, more recently, the fundamentals of sort of powder deagglomeration. So particularly how cohesive powders behave in turbulent flows. The pharmaceutical industry is the biggest application there, but obviously chemical processing as well. Um, there's the, the two in italics there are, are areas that essentially I'm just not going to have time to talk about today, but are two uh, other fundamental areas that we do a lot of work on. The first one being in turbulent reacting two-phase flows, um, which has sort of historically evolved from simpler uh, dilute uh, sort of sprays where we have droplets that are far apart from each other. They don't really interact with each other. So there's no collisions and, and coalescence and things like that. And sort of trying to understand how they behave in, in a turbulent flow. And that goes back, you know, people have been working on that for a very long time. Um, and that sort of work has evolved um, to looking at slightly more complicated problems where the liquid phase is um, denser. So essentially, we have uh, liquid fragments that are atomizing and are surrounded by a turbulent flow. And we're interested in understanding how, what role that has on um, essentially the formation or the stabilization of flames. Um, and that's gone from sort of auto ignition um, going back sort of five years where we looked at different atomizing conditions at the exit plane, trying to understand um, you know, uh, where the auto ignition point is for different types of configurations and then more recently we've moved into a turbulent piloted flames uh, where we can sort of control um, the degree of interaction that exists between droplets or non-spherical fragments at the exit plane and to try to understand what role that has on flame stability and, and other characteristics. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this on the next slide, but not too much, just some sort of recent work. Um, historically, we've done work like this in the past as well, where we try to take simultaneous measurements of different species in a reacting flow um, at the same time as sort of um, sort of identifying where the dispersed phase is with the aim here of trying to understand if we have a cluster of droplets, uh, what's happening around them. So what does the heat release zone look like? What do the reaction zone structures look like? Um, but this isn't something that I will talk about in more detail today. Uh, the other sort of fundamental topic, um, I've only got two figures I'm going to show here today, is a, a more recent one. Uh, looking at turbulent deposition. So here we're really interested in understanding what happens at the microscopic level um, on a surface where you have some sort of two-phase flow, usually particles that tend to accumulate on a surface and form aggregates. So this is a, an image using a technique we've developed um, called multi-channel optical coherence tomography. Those of you who were at the laser conference, you would have seen my presentation on this, but essentially uh, we're uh, identifying the interface um, of powder particles. So the scale of this is about um, half a millimeter. We can get a resolution down to about five to 10 microns 
and actually look at cavities uh, between agglomerates of particles and to try and understand what happens near the surface of any type of flow uh, when particles start to agglomerate or aggregate, uh, aggregate onto that surface. So obviously this has a role in those of you who are interested in the role of surface roughness and things like that, we are able to, to sort of analyze that sort of, um, those sort of um, topographic features, not only on the surface, but actually going into the actual, um, into the actual material as well. Um, so that's uh, some sort of a bit of a bit of an overview, I guess, of some of the fundamentals. On the application side, um, the one I'm going to talk about most today is pharmaceutical aerosols. Um, there's another three that we're interested in. Um, the, I guess two out of these three have, you know, gone a little bit further than, than the other. So on nozzle design, I mean, I, I count this as an application really, even though we look at this from a fundamental perspective sometimes. But here we're very interested in trying to understand how to control uh, spray formation beyond looking at just, you know, the fundamentals of how instabilities form. It's really about uh, developing new nozzle designs that make use of more than one type of atomization mode. Um, so the example on the left here, this is from Tushar Ahmed's uh, PhD, which he's working on right now, um, is looking at what happens if we impose a very high electric field um, into some sort of electrically insulating liquid, electrically insulating because most um, fuels that we use, at least complex fuels like diesels and, and biodiesels tend to be uh, dielectric electrically insulating liquids. Um, what happens if we impose a really high electric field, inject charge into that, um, and then simultaneously expose it to a shear flow? Um, so then it becomes a fundamental problem as well, trying to understand how instabilities are affected by an electric field, but it also gives you an extra knob to turn by changing the voltage. Essentially, you can control to an extent the droplet size. Um, and this gives you another example of that where we have different atomization stages and we try and essentially vary the proportion of each one to look at what impact we can have on the spray. Um, and that's sort of a, an application. On the sort of, uh, I guess I'm, I'm grouping this in, in disease transmission at the moment, but this is um, a lot of work that uh, started while I was still at, at Macquarie and has been ongoing now with Shaokun Chang over there. We're doing a, a lot of work at looking at the uh, flow in the human upper airway. Um, so the key application here has historically been pharmaceutical inhalation, but uh, disease transmission is obviously a topical one now. Um, but in the past, uh, people have also been very interested in understanding how aerosols can move um, out of someone's airway. Um, so this is something that we're, we're starting to work on now um, using sort of experimental configurations like this, where essentially we have models, different models of the human upper airway. Um, we have different ways where we can actuate movement of the airway walls to actually simulate a, um, physiologically how different types of airways tend to move because the airway is not static. It always moves around while we talk and, and breathe um, and really trying to understand how that, um, you know, uh, essentially it's a turbulent structure interaction problem where we're looking at a moving wall and, and a fluid flow behavior. Um, so what I'll focus on a bit later today more is on the pharmaceutical aerosol inhalation side, but this gives you an idea of some other applications. Uh, technique development is the uh, third focus area. So I'd say most of the work on technique development um, that we do here is mainly on the software side. So we do a lot of development on uh, sort of image processing tools to help us uh, analyze two-phase flows. Um, I kind of uh, showed you a, a bit of, a, of an image a couple slides ago on some sort of flame structures. So I mean, these techniques aren't new in the sense that, you know, people have been doing multi-species, uh, you know, uh, measurement for, for a while, um, but we do a lot of work in, in, in how we actually try and interpret those images and trying to analyze how the um, heat release zones sort of correspond to particular droplet structures and, and so on. Um, this is where most of our work really lies in terms of technique development right now, where we sort of try and make sense of images like that look like these. So if we have an image like this and it's, um, uh, you know, you have a high speed sequence of images, um, how can we do things like simultaneously measure um, the gas phase, which is between these fragments, try to understand the behavior of the liquid fragments themselves, not just characterize their size and surface areas, um, but also look at, um, you know, uh, the oscillation and whatever else that we actually can. So. Uh, things like volume fractions. We've been doing a lot of work in, in trying to deal with images like these. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, technique later um, in the more detailed bit of the presentation as well. Uh, this one is really just a snapshot of the, of the main features of an optical coherence tomography system, um, which we're using to try and measure uh, deposition behavior. So one of the key things that we want to do at some stage is to try and integrate this sort of technology with um, high speed imaging um, so that we can actually measure what happens uh, at the microscopic level on a surface um, to try to get those kind of topographical maps of particles depositing on a surface while at the same time um, being able to actually work out where those particles have originated from and how the deposition beha um, behavior changes as a function of the flow conditions. But, um, this one, you know, would, would take a presentation on its own to go through all the details, but essentially, if I had to describe it in one statement how this works, think of ultrasound, but with light instead of sound, right? So essentially, you're firing a wave at something and it's bouncing off of different interfaces and you're collecting that information back and you essentially analyze interference patterns um, to look at, uh, you know, some information on what your target actually looks like. So okay, that was a bit of a, a bit of a whirlwind tour of uh, I guess all of the the sort of active work at the moment. So I'll, I'll choose um, a couple of topics to talk about in a little bit more detail. So the first one is going to be turbulent spray formation. Um, a lot of this has come out of Gajendra and Albi's work over over the years. So Gajendra just finished his PhD and Albi um, finished his PhD a few years ago and is now a, a postdoc who sort of migrated from this area to the pharmaceutical area, um, but he's still sort of active in, in this and, and Assad um, has been involved with um, all of this um, over, over the years. So I'll talk about this um, in a little bit more detail. So the first point, uh, particularly for those of us who aren't really in, in the field of sprays, right? I guess the, the point is why are, we, why are we still working on sprays? They've been around for a very long time. Um, so that I don't want to linger on this slide too much, but essentially the, the key issues are that we still don't really have an ability to control droplet size, particularly effectively. So there are some basic, um, I guess, correlations and basic tools that allow us to measure um, things like the overall mean size, you know, different measures of mean size, but in terms of actually being able to predict a full size distribution of droplets or, or um, liquid fragments, it's still not fully in our grasp. And that's really what we ultimately want to be able to try to do. Um, and we want to be able to control that distribution um, based on a particular experimental condition. So we have a particular problem we need. Um, we feed back what that problem is telling us. So if, if there's a target and that target has moved away or if the surrounding temperature has increased and we need to generate a finer spray, what can we do to our spray conditions to essentially, in, in, a, in a sense, ultimately actively change what your droplets are, are doing. So a lot of this, um, the fundamental work that we've been interested in is trying to understand the role of instabilities in this problem. Um, so it's very hard for us to measure all of the instabilities, but we've made some, some headway there. Um, so if you look at the, the top row um, in terms of trying to understand how, you know, these initial perturbations on the liquid jet amplify and grow with time and what role they actually have on the, on the subsequent uh, formation of, of droplets. Um, and that, you know, if we can control these instabilities and there are different ways that you can do that, for instance, electrostatic atomization or even with effervescent atomization, you can generate uh, longitudinal instabilities. Um, then maybe we'll get a little bit of a step closer to controlling the, the droplet size. So, the, so this is the, the first topic, right? Turbulent spray formation, or the first sort of detailed topic, I guess. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit first what you know, the key questions are really that we're trying to answer here. Um, and then I'll go into some of the key topics, diagnostics platforms. I won't linger on that too much, just some basics of how we actually took the data. Um, and then I'll focus a little bit in, in more detail on the, on the fundamentals. Um, looking at instability development. Um, most of this is work from, I'd say, the last five years or, or so. So the key sort of um, scientific questions, the, the, I guess the big one is, can we relate instability size to ligament and droplet size? Um, if we can do that, then maybe we're a step closer to relating um, instability size to what happens in the nozzle. We can't actually measure what happens in the nozzle. Um, but others can. So I know that, um, you know, the, in fact, the Monash group does a lot of work in sort of measuring these kind of really 
um, dense sort of problems or measuring behind uh, structures where you can try and uh, ultimately, hopefully, relate instabilities to what's happening inside there. Um, the, the second point is, can we categorize some of this information, even generally according to the key dimensionless groups in terms of, you know, what uh, instabilities form under what conditions? And can we, I mean, this is the big one, right? Can we actually predict the shape uh, of the droplet size distribution? So what I mean there is the, essentially the probability density function of droplet size using um, statistical information on, on wavelengths. So those are some of the key questions that we're trying to answer here. In terms of the um, experimental setup, I'll talk about this very briefly, but uh, most of the images I'll show here have been taken from high-speed backlight imaging. So it's a, you know, essentially a shadow graph style imaging where you have some sort of high-speed light source which is diffused um, and you shine that over your um, measurement volume and then you use a long distance microscope to focus in onto that point um, so that you can get a nice highly resolved image of um, your near field spray features or whatever it is that you want to measure. Um, so in these experiments we've been doing that high speed backlight imaging from two different angles um, and we use two lasers splitting each laser in two so essentially we get two pairs, um, two pairs of beams so four beams in total. Um, and that allows us to get a delta T. So essentially you, you run your cameras in a kind of PIV setting um, so that you can get a delta T from two different angles. Um, so we've, we've done a lot of work in sort of, um, you know, developing the, the technique itself is not complicated, right? It's quite standard, um, but in terms of how you actually deal with, with the images them, themselves. So this gives you just a little bit of a more detail on what the images actually look like. <clears throat> so if uh, you're looking at one fragment, um, this one is just showing you that liquid fragment that's formed, and this is the same object formed uh, from a different viewing point, and then from left to right you have a delta T, and so it's slightly shifted spatially, um, and so then you can get um, velocity information. In terms of the images that you can get, it uh, depends on the lens, so most of our um, sort of configurations are in the kind of three to five micron uh, pixel resolution. Uh, we can get down to about one but then you lose a lot on the, on the field of view. So it really depends on what sort of problem you want to look at. In our case, we're just interested in um, mainly large scale instabilities. So the spatial resolution works um, fairly well. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'll talk, I, I'm not going to talk about how we deal with those images in a lot of detail. Um, but essentially we have done quite a bit of work over the years and actually taking those images and then extracting quantitative information. I'll talk about what that uh, data is telling us. So in terms of the cases we're looking at here, so this is just a, a selection of four cases uh, where we're, we're basically looking at a standard uh, problem where we have a liquid jet uh, in the center line and we have some air flowing around it. So this is a very canonical problem in two-phase flows. We call, we call it a coaxial air blast atomizer for, for those of you who don't know. And essentially what happens largely as this sort of flows, depending on the Weber number, um, you'll have these instabilities that form on the surface. Um, and then eventually um, you, those instabilities will basically will turn into ligaments and then those ligaments further downstream will turn into droplets. Um, as you increase your Weber number, this uh, looks like a, a much more sort of violent problem. If you watch this video over and over again, you will see something where essentially um, it's not just the instabilities that form in the near field, but you also have these kinks where if you can see where my mouse cursor is that form uh, essentially perpendicular to the flow direction. Um, and if you keep watching it, you'll see that. Um, and most of us believe that those are um, Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. So you have essentially a, a liquid fragment that is accelerating. Um, you have, so rather than a gravitational body force, which is what you, you know, the traditional Rayleigh-Taylor instability, you have, a, you have a body force term there. Um, so we have an acceleration term, and then we, we also have a density gradient. It's a very significant density gradient, of course, here, because we have liquid um, and air around it. So in the near field, um, those instabilities are likely mostly Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities because we just have a really um, high shear here um, and those sort of grow and, and amplify with time. 
Um, and in lower Weber number cases, you don't really see Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities like in the top left one, um, but you, you do still see kelvin helmholtz So there's a lot of questions around what regions of the flow, you know, have what type of instability and is it important? And can we use this to, to predict droplet size? So this was uh, largely out of Gajendra's PhD thesis, which he, he, he just uh, submitted a few months ago. And essentially, the idea here was to look at a, a really a truly massive range of cases, looking at different Weber numbers, Reynolds numbers, mass flux ratios, um, 2 million images, which uh, this is Gajendra's slide, so he'd get annoyed if I didn't say that he collected 2 million images. Um, uh, so obviously, it's a very broad range of, of cases that we've sort of looked at here. So the, the, one of the sort of key things that we wanted to do then was actually measure the wavelength and amplitude on all of these different types of problems at different conditions. Um, I won't talk about the steps that we followed um, in detail. The paper on this stuff is, is published now. Um, so if you're interested, you can, you can just email me and, and, or you can just look it up. Um, but essentially, um, we follow a series of steps where we're identifying the interface and we're actually measuring over time how these uh, amplitudes and wavelengths are, are <clears throat> changing as a function of Weber number and, and all the various other uh, dimensionless numbers. So the, the other part that we are interested in is understanding past this near field zone. So that's part of the problem is really measuring those instabilities, building up some statistics on what happens afterwards. So in terms of these kind of droplets that form and what we call ligaments, and we have various conditions that we've kind of historically defined over many years, um, you know, what we call a ligament and, and what we call a droplet. And so the idea really is, can we relate um, instabilities to these different types of shapes? And can we attribute a particular instability to a particular um, shape? So if we go through some uh, results here, um, the first thing that, we, that I'll present here is just because it's a fairly simple to understand, um, we have two different types of waves that we're measuring. We're calling it very creative name, the first wave. So that's the wave that sort of begins to develop um, over the, um, essentially the first field of view. And we're taking an average uh, of, of that wave over many thousands of images. And then the last wave, which is just prior to breakup. So we identify where the breakup of the liquid jet is. And then we take statistics of the wavelengths of the, um, essentially the primary instability just before that breakup location. So with the first wave, I guess, as you would expect, and this agrees with um, previous uh, statements as well, though there hasn't been nearly as much data, um, is that you know, as you uh, increase your liquid jet Reynolds number, this wavelength decreases. Um, and we also um, generally saw a transition that happened where we would essentially expect it to happen, where suddenly we would get a shift in some of the data at that turbulent transition. And we had a, a pretty good um, feel for how these wavelengths varied as a function of Reynolds number. Um, if you plotted it versus um, you know, other sort of dimensionless groups, it didn't sort of fall onto a, a trend that was as convincing. Um, if you move towards your last wave, uh, what we found is that they trended much more with the aerodynamic forces, which again makes sense, right? So this is the point where uh, your liquid jet has moved away from the nozzle. Uh, you have this really high shear. So what's happening surrounding the liquid jet is now impacting uh, the formation of those, um, of those waves. So it's essentially a kelvin helmholtz instability, really, that's being driven by these, um, this shear. So the, what we, we wanted to dig into a little bit of detail here. So um, after sort of analyzing this general, um, just the mean wavelengths and, and getting some information, the idea was to actually look now at the statistical distributions. Um, we opted to show this as a wavelength over amplitude ratio, simply because it made it a little bit easier to uh, look at all the data. Um, so, I mean, it is, it is dimensionless, but you know, we've got to be a little bit careful here because one depends on the other. So they're not independent uh, variables. So as you have a, you know, your wave is going to grow. Generally, we see the um, amplitudes increase um, as your wavelength shrinks, sorry, and as your wavelength um, gets bigger, the amplitude tends to go down. So essentially, a, a situation where you have a long meandering wave um, just close to the, to the liquid jet exit um, would have a, a fairly high um, lambda over A, which is, you know, what this curve is showing you. And as you go downstream, your lambda over A tends to decrease. Now, the bit that we found quite interesting, and there was reference to this in an old um, 
96 uh, JFM paper by the, the French uh, group, Marmotan. They still do a lot of work in sort of liquid jet instabilities that you should reach some sort of, some sort of plateau in terms of um, this ratio. And we sort of observe that, that you, know, you get to just below breakup and your lambda over A always gets stuck at this value that's roughly, roughly speaking, equal to two. Um, so we analyzed all of the data um, from all of the different cases. And we did actually find that this wavelength over amplitude ratio does tend to reach a near constant value. Okay, so it reaches a value that kind of hovers between two to three, um, and that happens at breakup. Um, so we've confirmed this over um, uh, quite a, a broad range of cases. So then the next sort of line of thinking here is, well, then if we know that this on average lambda over A reaches a constant value at breakup, then it means that anything past that point, a ligament, for instance, that forms, um, should be forming from waves that are of the order of a lambda over A of two or less, because as we move closer to the jet exit, we know that that lambda over A actually decreases. So if you invoke that assumption, um, and this is without any empirical constants or shifting data or anything, um, what we get is our uh, probability density function of a primary wavelength. And then on top of that, we have the wavelength distribution at, uh, sorry, the ligament size distribution at different positions downstream. And generally the further downstream um, you go, this is still very close to, to the exit plane, is the point where we have a, a very good agreement between our lambda P. Um, so for whatever number 80, you can see it essentially all of the cases very close to um, the point where ligaments form are right on top of the wavelength distribution. There's a little bit of a, of a discrepancy that occurs, particularly at a, a high Weber number. In this case, you'd have a lot of secondary atomization also. Um, but essentially, the, the key point is that the, 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 di the functional distribution, the shapes are consistent. So it means that, um, and certainly the orders of magnitude are, are very, very convincing. So it means that essentially the, the way that you uh, can predict droplet size, uh, well, you can predict droplet size if you know what the, the wavelength um, is actually doing, which was a, a nice part of, um, of this study. So it kind of confirmed that link. Now that's for uh, ligament ligaments. So ligaments are one thing, but you know the the holy grail here is droplets, right? So at the end of the day, we want to be able to predict what happens much further downstream where the droplets form. Now these are much harder to wrap your head around because we know from looking at what's happening that droplets don't really form from the primary core, right? They they form from ligaments further downstream. Uh, we also know from what's happening that. Um, despite everyone really liking a lot of these secondary atomization models where, you know, a droplet breaks up into smaller droplets, we very, very rarely observe that happening. Uh, these droplets always tend to form from ligaments um, that form downstream where you have those little kinks, which for the most part we believe are really Taylor instabilities. So we are trying to measure them, but it is quite complicated. Now, if you kind of ignore that, and this is what's historically been done in the past, and just say, well, I mean, okay, if we can't measure the Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, maybe we can try and relate the overall average uh, droplet size to what happens closer to the exit plane, so what we call the primary instability. Um, it's actually not horrific in the sense that, you know, you've got, these are all of our various cases that, you know, they're sort of hovering in this sort of region. Um, and, you know, if you look at older models um, as well, this kind of order of magnitude um, approximation has been basically as good as it gets. Um, so, but the point here is that essentially, if you determine what your primary instability wavelength is, uh, the Weber number comes out of, uh, out of the picture now. It doesn't really matter anymore. As long as you relate your overall SMD to the instabilities, you can define them consistently. Um, but, you know, we want to do much better than this, right? A change from 0.2 to 0.4 is, is huge when it comes to a, a practical application. You know, you might be talking about a, a, a massive, uh, you know, two-fold increase in, in droplet size there. So then how do we sort of deal with this? It means that you need to consider secondary instabilities that form further downstream. So we did some work on this. This is moving a little bit further back where we, we weren't able to actually measure the Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. But we were, a, we were able to, I would say, quasi-measure them. Um, really, it's a, a, still a theoretical calculation, but 
We have measurements of the, the gas phase that surrounds the Israeli-Taylor instabilities, um, so we can predict them theoretically in terms of what their wavelength is um, using a measured value, uh, a rough measured value of acceleration. And surprisingly, um, this worked extremely well for very high turbulence intensity flows um, where you could have, so your line is your theoretical Rayleigh-Taylor wavelength and your asterisks there are your droplet sizes as you measure them. Um, so, you know, this, this looked great. Um, I remember the first time I looked at this, I was amazed. And then you try it at um, lower turbulence intensities and the results were, were, were garbage, basically. <laughs> they just did not work. Um, so um, there's still a big problem in trying to predict the droplet size distributions from instability wavelengths. And that's largely because we haven't yet measured them. So if we're able to actually measure the Rayleigh-Taylor instability on fragments, um, then I think we'll be in a position where we can develop better um, models to actually try and predict what those sizes will be. And the Rayleigh-Taylor wavelength can be uh, fairly well linked to the primary instability. Um, and then you can just work your way back then uh, with the primary instability being related to what's happening actually in the boundary layer inside the nozzle. So essentially we want to be able to work all the way back to the nozzle as much as we can uh, to try and predict the ultimate droplet size, uh, as difficult as that is. Okay, so that's um, all that I will talk about uh, with regards to turbulent spray formation. That's a one, one little segment of, of a lot of the work that we, we work on there. So the next, uh, the next is a more recent sort of area looking at pharmaceutical aerosols. So um, so Alby, who did a lot of his early PhD work on, on this, is now a postdoc in this area. So, you know, I've got to acknowledge him and Gajendra is now, has now started working on this. And a lot of this work is with the School of Pharmacy, uh, Kim Chan here, and then Macquarie uh, Kali Del Serf, who's a PhD student there. Um, some of the, the results that he's generated over the last couple of years, I'll, I'll show here. And that's a collaboration with uh, Xiao Kun Cheng, also from Macquarie. So the, uh, on, on the sort of pharmaceutical side of things, I will focus on two uh, topics. The first one is really looking at uh, what we've done at, at trying to essentially adopt a lot of the research style that we do in, in liquid sprays, which is more, a little bit more canonical, looking at more fundamental problems, trying to translate that over into the pharmaceutical powder space. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about single agglomerate dynamics. I think I, I should probably have time. Um, so we'll see how we go. So the, the key scientific uh, questions here, um, when we started working on this, I guess when we, we looked at pharmaceutical powders and the field in general, um, it's just not really where it needs to be with regards to fundamental understanding of how a lot of these um, carrier powders are, tr are transported in turbulent flows. And in most pharmaceutical um, inhalation problems, the flow is turbulent. It, it'll at least be transitional, but usually turbulent. So can we sort of you know, overhaul, essentially rethink the way that we describe uh, fluidization, deagglomeration, and transport, uh, say cohesive powders, because the, the vast majority of pharmaceutical powders are cohesive, uh, particularly in the, the most important applications um, so in applications in, say, uh, COPD or uh, cystic fibrosis or inhaled antibiotics, um, you need to have a very high dose of powder. And you can't really get away with diluting the powder with, um, with, with particles that are not an active pharmaceutical ingredient. So you want everything to be just drug. Um, and the drug particles have to be very small. Uh, two to five microns in order to make it to the lungs. And what happens when you have a big clump of very small particles is they just stick together. Um, and so there's a real um, interest in trying to understand how these very cohesive powders um, can actually de-agglomerate um, and get transported in, in turbulent flows. Um, so as part of that, we also want to understand um, how powders uh, get through the airways in terms of how they deposit onto the human airways not only fundamental stuff here, but also a little bit more applied in terms of you know, what physiology actually does um, to the fluid dynamics of the upper airway. Um, and then finally, can we actually use all of this to make attempts to generalize the design process of pharmaceutical dry powder inhalers? So the FDA is also very interested in stuff like this, where you can kind of look at more generic devices that have a 
a kind of rigid um, design process be behind them because right now there's there's a few kind of regulations there but it's a little bit it's a little bit in terms of the techniques that are used that they're not particularly um, advanced so there's a lot more work that can be done here so in terms of uh, the the basics of powder fluidization we started very simple really just trying to look at a, a very basic turbulent channel flow um, so we started with uh, a fully developed turbulent channel flow in a cavity of powder um, looking at different types of powder properties so powders are a lot more complicated than liquids with liquids you know we've got density surface tension uh, viscosity and you know it's all well and good and, and we can kind of navigate that with powders there's a lot of different properties and they can vary a lot with humidity and there are many different types of forces that keep the particles together. So essentially, it, you know, you need to work um, with, with uh, groups that can actually manufacture these powders to a very specific, to very specific characteristics so that you have a certain control over the properties. Um, so what we're varying here is the particle size largely um, so that we can vary the cohesiveness. Um, and in terms of the, the experiments that we do, we started with just very basic laser extinction uh, measurements to try and understand how, um, you know, these uh, cavities get emptied with powder over time. And we've since moved on to uh, more complicated measurements involving high speed imaging, uh, PIV. So right now it's sort of moving to stereoscopic PIV um, and we want to do uh, multi-angle illumination soon as well. So in, just to give you an overview of the experiment here, so essentially uh, what we wanted to understand very basically, this is also very useful for people who do things like DEM modeling. So um, for those of you familiar with discrete element method modeling, so that's quite popular um, when it comes to modeling powders, but there's very little quantitative data out there um, that can be used for validation purposes. So that is also one of our key goals here is to try and, and serve that um, that sort of niche. So essentially, one thing that we analyzed very simply was the attrition rate of the powders, um, tracking the actual interface of the powder bed as a function of time. And a, a key sort of result here, which, you know, is, is intuitive, but is essentially something that we were be able to confirm is that at very high Reynolds numbers, uh, what essentially happens is that the attrition rate of the powder becomes more and more independent from the powder properties. Um, what we also found, which was very nice, uh, um, sort of uh, really simple in this particular experiment, was that you could um, predict the frequency of powder attrition um, using a really simple theoretical scaling um, based on the advective mean time scale. Um, so, you know, this, this is simple to fluid mechanicists and, and to us, but, you know, that kind of um, very fundamental approach um, is very useful when it comes to the design of inhalers and doesn't really exist. Um, at the moment. Um, so that was um, one of the first studies that we did where we just tried to understand um, how rapidly these powders um, essentially vacate typical types of powder pocket designs as a function of Reynolds number. So the, the more uh, sort of recent uh, work moving away from simple experiments like that uh, was uh, doing uh, high speed particle imaging where we do particle tracking um, as well as analysis of the, of the shape uh, and size of the particles in, in real time. So one thing that we were interested in here uh, was looking at how the velocity magnitude in these, um, essentially the distribution, probability distribution of velocity magnitude in these problems um, can be predicted in terms of how it, shi how it shifts with respect to the particle size distribution. And the two are linked uh, very closely, um, which was also very useful as a, as a design tool. Um, but another sort of recent finding um, is that we were able to get some degree of universality in the way that these sorts of problems behave um, by uh, measuring a local Stokes number. So when we actually measured the local Stokes numbers of these particles in different regions of the powder pocket, um, we were able to actually get a nice, a very nice collapse uh, of data. Um, so what this actually is here is a measurement of the local fluctuation velocity of a particular particle size band with respect to the surrounding gas phase fluctuating velocity. Uh, and all of this data collapsed onto a single curve. Um, and this is uh, very useful again when it comes to predicting uh, what happens with some of these carrier powders. And this applied over a broad range of properties um, as well. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of the, of the sort of work that we are interested in uh, in the pharmaceutical powder sort of space. So 
I'll probably go on for another five minutes, I think, and then we can uh, open it up for, for questions. Um, so the next sort of topic uh, was single agglomerate dynamics. So this is probably one of the most complicated and annoying experiments that uh, we've, we've done over the years. It's very simple, but it is extremely challenging to deliver one agglomerate <laughs> onto a surface and to look at how that fragments. And, you know, just even under the free fall case, that's a very simple problem. We wanted to actually um, have that agglomerate delivered in a flow um, as well. So this was a uh, part of um, what Albie Lowe, uh, who's done his postdoc over the last year, has been working on. So essentially, the experiment itself is, is very simple. It's just extremely time consuming. Um, there has been older work at looking at how agglomerates break up into particles, but it's all been very, very qualitative. Um, you know, using kind of old school imaging and essentially just saying, yep, this agglomerate breaks up and that one doesn't. And it's essentially uh, that sort of uh, level of validation that DEM models have, have had. So as part of our, our project with the FDA, um, the deliverable really was to come up with a much more extensive uh, quantitative uh, understanding of how these agglomerates break up as part of developing a new set of uh, tuned DEM models. So essentially we've got an actuator and we have a single agglomerate that gets delivered into a channel, very simple, and we have a continuous flow uh, and that agglomerate will impact onto a plate. We've had lots of different versions of this experiment where rather than impacting onto a plate, there's actually a grid inside the channel itself, um, which is a little bit more um, physiologically representative in terms of how inhalers actually work. But essentially, uh, the main thing that we're changing here is the constituent particle size. The size of the individual particles that make up these agglomerates, we change them from three to six microns. That may not sound like a lot, but it's a huge, huge uh, difference in terms of the impact that um, that has on the fragmentation behavior. Um, and then we also look at the effect of uh, different uh, velocities. These are the size distributions of the, of the uh, particles that make up each individual agglomerate. So this shows you some sort of uh, sequences of, of some of the images that you would collect um, going. So the top here is a free fall case where, you know, your agglomerate hits the plate and then rebounds, basically what we're calling an elastic collision. And then we have various particles. So this isn't really a fluid mechanics problem now. It's a, there's no flow, right? So um, there's a little bit, you know, as this uh, agglomerate actually rotates, you have a little bit of entrainment that actually happens, which you can see. Um, as it's sort of rebounding from the plate. And essentially, we want to understand the, the size and velocity characteristics of these fragments after a deagglomeration event um, and uh, relate that to the strength of the agglomerate um, and also you know, other, other conditions of the experiment. Now, you can imagine that you don't just deliver an agglomerate onto a plate and get an image this nice, right? Um, it's not just a one-off experiment. You need to do dozens and dozens and dozens of experiments in order to collect uh, a significant enough sample set so that you can um, essentially have images to, to work with. So it's an extremely time consuming experiment. Um, in the air assisted problem, obviously there's more fragmentation, um, but essentially what also ends up happening is the layer, the deposited layer on the plate changes as well. And we're actually interested in, in understanding that also. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a taste, because I don't think I don't want to talk for too much more, I've probably already spoken for too long. Um, in terms of the sort of data that we're extracting here, um, we're looking at joint, um, joint sort of size uh, and surface area um, statistics, joint size and velocity statistics, where we're trying to understand essentially how the aspect ratio as well. In fact, these are aspect ratios, sorry, not surface area. Um, so we're trying to understand uh, the aspect ratio of the particles as a function of the area of the particle. Um, and what you basically see is a bimodal behavior um, that exists when the uh, agglomerate is not fragmenting significantly. Um, so that's the parent agglomerate and the smaller particles that you're measuring. And then over time, or as you increase the uh, velocity, um, you'll see that bimodality start to disappear. And what we're doing now is we're, we're sort of trying to extend this a little bit further um, to try and understand how these, um, the dynamics of these particles. So in terms of how fast they're moving off of the agglomerate and what the attrition rate is. This is very important in pharmaceuticals because you don't just have a flow there all the time in a dry powder inhaler, you know, depending on how sick the person is, they can inhale for about 
four seconds. That's about as much as, as you can inhale for. Um, so it's a very transient sort of problem. So we're really trying to understand um, how these particles form over time and, and what sort of essentially modifications you can make to the drug formulation to try and, and improve this um, process. Okay, so I think I'll um, sort of do some concluding remarks now. So focusing on these two topics, in terms of where I think, the, where I think we should, we're headed or where we should probably go, in terms of sprays, um, I didn't really talk a lot about um, what I mentioned, some of the work that, that we do in uh, nozzle design, where you have different modes of atomization. Um, this kind of what we call hybridization of atomization so that you can give you more knobs to turn. So different ways of generating the spray all at the same time, which can actively respond to a particular condition, I think is very important. So you may have an agricultural spray problem or, a, or it could be any, any sort of application, could be combustion, um, where you're feeding back information on the actual environment where the spray is being delivered and you are actively varying the atomization mode um, using some form of hybridization. I think that's very important. So uh, these instabilities, I, I referred to Rayleigh-Taylor and KH instabilities. There are also Rayleigh-Plateau instabilities um, at lower Weber number. It's a much more surface tension dominated problem. So there will be localized regions of the spray, particularly on, on a small scale, um, where you may have more than one type of instability. So as these liquid fragments accelerate and they reach some sort of near constant uh, velocity and they start to break up, uh, what was once a Rayleigh-Taylor instability dominated problem now becomes a Rayleigh-Plateau instability problem on the small scale. So we have done a little bit of work in the past trying to understand the local scale, what happens in sprays. Um, and there's some interesting findings there. I didn't present uh, any of them here, um, but essentially there is a degree in a sense of uh, kind of a little bit more universality on what happens on the very local scale in a two-phase flow, um, which may or may not lead us to something interesting there. Um, the links between sort of, uh, you know, the, the formation rate of the spray and what happens downstream, I think we need to, to do a lot more there. And imaging, there's always more that can be done on imaging. Um, a key problem here is a lot of this is really money uh, is the biggest problem really just to be able to, to get a larger um, dynamic range. So essentially a, a larger field of view with a very high resolution. There's some work actually at um, I think Melbourne Uni that was being done for uh, sort of single phase in PIV where you have lots of cheap uh, cameras and you're trying to build up a very large field of view with uh, with a high resolution. So I think that in sprays would be extremely useful because right now we're not able to track um, where a droplet or fragment, the history of a droplet or fragment over time, which means that a lot of these conclusions are through inference rather than, than actual joint statistics. Uh, pharmaceutical powders, there is really um, almost an endless amount of work to be done here, I would say. Um, uh, but one of the key conclusions I'd say if I had to pick something that's been the most important is that at least at low Reynolds number or at a transitional sort of Reynolds number, which applies to um, the most important problems as far as treatment goes, people with very significantly inhibited breathing, um, the properties are, of the drug are very important and very small changes in the properties um, have a completely different uh, impact on how these uh, particles get transported or become fragmented. So it's, it's no surprise really that there is a massive disparity between different sort of dry powder inhaler devices, how they work, why many of them are different, because everyone's using different drug formulations and different devices because most of them are patented and so people can't actually, you know, <laughs> end up doing a lot of the work that they need to. Um, but I think that's a, a key problem, right? Trying to understand uh, the role of properties um, in pharmaceutical powders. Uh, this kind of canonical approach to inhaler device design, I think, is, is really important. Um, certainly already has led us down some really interesting findings. And one I didn't talk about at all, really, physiology. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work there with interfacing with, with people who work in airway physiology. Um, 
but you know they're not fluid mechanicists, right? So translating what happens in in the airwave from physiology language to fluid mechanics in terms of okay, what's the actual uh, the local Reynolds number? You know, what's the boundary layer doing? Um, what does that mean in terms of disease severity is a very interesting area. You'll actually see that some very specific changes happen to the airway for um, particular diseases that change the flow behavior um, during inspiration. Um, and, you know, we're certainly not the only group who's working on this. Many others are, but in terms of looking at this dynamic um, uh, change in airway wall motion and building up larger MRI imaging bases, um, is, is I'd say something we're working on quite strongly now and I think um, is, is very interesting. Um, and deposition, that's the final point. I think a lot more to be done here, not just for pharmaceuticals, but agricultural apl applications as well. Um, ultimately, when you're, when you're breathing in a powder or a spray, you want it to land on something. Um, and we don't really have very good deposition models. Um, so the, the most kind of advanced uh, deposition model um, recently, probably three or four years ago, which, you know, they tried to, to sort of validate it on actual in vivo data, um, just failed uh, to compare to any, any experimental condition. They just don't work um, because what happens uh, near the surface is, is quite complicated. Um, so I think moving away from empiricism there, um, trying to look at the fundamentals a bit, we also need more measurements. I think that's an important thing. Okay, so that's, that's it. So uh, acknowledgements, the PhD students at the top there who've um, obviously done a lot of this work, Ajendra Khalid, Taye, uh, Tushar, and, and Othman, and um, Aldi and Fung, who was a postdoc with us. Yongling um, was with us for a short while, but he's uh, done a lot of the work on the airway uh, fluid flow with PIV, and Asad, Kim, and, and Shao Kun, who've been involved with a lot of these things, and of course, um, uh, eternal, internal gratefulness to uh, uh, all of the funding bodies. Um, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for that, Aggie. There's um, a whole, I'm sure everyone's clapping wildly with their um, mics muted right now. Um, did anyone have any questions for Aggie? You can, if you don't want to um, speak, you can pop it into the um, chat box. Otherwise, um, any questions? Maybe I'll just stop the... Um, so if no one else has any initial questions, something I was just wanting to qualify, you said that there was a um, Rayleigh-Taylor instability at low Weber number, and at, then, and then there's Weber a, sorry? At high Weber numbers. High? At high Weber numbers. Oh, oh okay, because there was a secondary instability, which you were also calling a, um, a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, right? Like there were two Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, one which was a secondary instability, and one which I thought was an instability at low Weber numbers. Is that right? So the, the, the low Weber number, I guess, is the, um, the, I was referring to the Rayleigh plateau instability. Um, so which is a kind of surface tension. Oh, okay, yep. Related one. Um, but, you know, the, the secondary, what I call the secondary instability, I mean, we're not 100% sure if, you know, if you're referring to that figure where I had circled the secondary instability. Yep. Um, we're not 100% sure if those are, in fact, those may well not be Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities because we see them on the primary core as well. We don't see the Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities you'll see on, uh, on parts of the liquid jet that are really accelerating, um, uh, accelerating away from, from the main core. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, haven't really, we haven't really been able to confirm that everything that we see is a Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Um, that's yeah. Yeah. I see some questions. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, I was going to unmute uh, Daniel first. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Whoops. We both, we both hit unmute at once and it cancelled out. Uh, thanks, Aggie. Um, good to see you. Thanks for the talk. Um, I had a quick question about um, the liquid atomization stuff. Now, this is, a, I'll, I'll preface by saying this is a bit of an unfair question because I know there isn't really an answer, but it's more of a question about where do we go next? Um, so a lot of these um, optical experiments are really nice. Um, 
but I guess the issue is when we look, we know from sort of the last couple of decades of experience that when we look at instabilities in uh, liquid jets, so you take your classical coax atomizer and you look at the instabilities and then you um, and then you measure them as accurately as you can and you try and correlate that with, for example, droplet size distributions or whatever, you find that the correlations are always poor. It's, it's very messy and you go from one nozzle or injector to another and then things completely change. Um, and we've known for about, I would say, five years now that the, the VOF simulations, volume of fluid simulations have gotten good enough. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of the Agrawal and Trujillo from Wisconsin, Madison, the stuff that they've done where they sort of show that um, even when you do really well resolved VOF and you have effectively a perfect measurement of the ligament properties, their volume, size is whatever, that the correlation between that and the droplet size distribution in actuality is, is poor anyway. So even if you could continue to push the measurement technique, the problem is no longer measurement technique limited. It's the physics of the, of the spray that, mm -hmm. And so if you like, I guess the question is as, as a, from one experimentalist to another looking at sprays, where do you go from here? Like, is, is it necessarily like, I don't know if better measurements are going to of, you know, ligaments and droplets and primary atomization is going to help much. Like um, what's your thoughts about, um, about like, you know, what the next sort of steps in, you know, from a fundamental perspective are in terms of fundamental spray measurement. Yeah. That's a really easy question, Daniel. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of sarcasm there. Um, yeah, look, that, that's a tough one, right? So one, one thing I would say, right, in terms of just going back to what I mentioned on the slide, when we tried to correlate the, the ligament sizes to the instabilities, we were able to do that by looking at the instability wavelengths that formed just prior to breakup below that particular wavelength over amplitude ratio. Okay, because that was the predominant, essentially, it's the most common. So the mode of the PDF was there, the mean was there, was the most common lambda over A value. So if you actually forget about that and take all of the data, so forget about this restriction to lambda over A being less than two, the, there will not be a matchup between the, the wavelengths and the ligament sizes. So I guess my answer to you is that I don't think we will ever be able to blanketly relate instability wavelengths to sizes, but we may be able to relate particular bands of ligament or droplet size to particular bands of wavelength or and or amplitude combinations. So I, I you know, whether or not that's gonna hold up, you know, in a different type of atomizer, because this was a coax atomizer, which we all love because it's really nice and, and axisymmetric and so on. Um, I don't know, um, but we have, I mean, there, there's still, you know, one, one thing I can say, not so much related to the correlation between its abilities and droplet sizes, but we have done experiments recently in uh, electrostatic atomizers, in pressure atomizers, and in coax atomizers. And the sort of themes that we get on the scale of the droplet um, in terms of uh, the, the, in terms of the droplet size as a function of the local Weber number, everything kind of follows a very similar trend. So we, we've, only, we've only just recently done this, right? So I don't have enough data, but I, I, I'm not convinced that we'll ever be able to, to blanketly relate ligament and droplet size to wavelengths, but I do think we can come up with something that's a lot better than what exists right now. Because even if you look at the empirical correlations that you're referring to, none of them have, have been developed on the basis of the full size distribution. It's always averages, right? So it, you might actually not be capturing the physics at all. So this was the problem with the, when we tried to relate Rayleigh-Taylor instability wavelength to droplets, I mentioned before, we epically failed at low turbulence intensity. You could still develop a correlation, which we did. It's in the paper. Um, but the distribution of the wavelength was, you know, a, a, a non-skewed bell curve. And the distribution of the droplet sizes was, you know, a really broad Nukiyama Tanasawa distribution. They were just completely different, right? So essentially, there's no way that you'd be able to convincingly uh, say to anyone that, yeah, you've captured the physics by just looking at the mean. So I guess we have to first be able to convince ourselves that we can capture the full statistical distributions. And the only way you can do that is through a measurement. Um, but yeah, I mean, the other, I mean, I don't know how 
how far we can take it, right, um, with other types of atomizers. But I, you know, I, I don't think we should give up yet, um, despite how good the modeling is getting. <laughs> you know. Yeah. All right. Thank, yeah. Thanks very much. No worries. I think we've got a few. Um, yeah. Hi, Amy. Uh, thanks for unmuting me. I just have a question. It's it's good to see you and thank you for the talk. I just have a question regarding the powder bit. How did, how did you calculate the local Stokes number? So um, essentially, the only way you can do that properly is if you have a powder that has a broad enough particle size distribution so that some of the particles have Stokes numbers uh, less than one, right, or close to one. So essentially what you do is in, in the measurement, you, you need to have some kind of reasonable estimate of what the local gas phase is doing. So you can work out a slip velocity um, and then you measure the particle size um, from that same particle and then you estimate a, a Stokes number that way. So you measure the slip velocity and then calculate the particle response time and then using a, you know, just let's say kind of um, characteristic flow time and then make a, a Stokes number? Yes, yes. Like, so you didn't use a turbulence time scale or Kolmogorov growth time scale or anything like that? No, so, I mean, you can, you can, you can scale, well, so you can scale, I mean, you can work at a Stokes number depending on what flow time scale you want to use. In our case, we've just scaled it based on essentially the integral scale. Um, so we can measure a, a local RMS of fluctuations. Um, and that's our, our estimate for our velocity scale on the integral scale. Um, and then to, for the integral scale itself, you have to make some kind of estimate based on what kind of flow you have. So you know, we haven't actually done a, a two-point correlation measurement to measure the integral scale. Of, Potentially, we could. Um, I mean, we, we could do that, but we haven't we haven't bothered. It's just a kind of averaged, essentially local Stokes number. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we probably need to wrap up in a couple of minutes. But um, did you want to ask your question, Tushar? Hi. Just a quick question. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk, Aggie. I am Tushar from Melbourne Uni. So regarding your turbulence phase, uh, was it done in a quiescent co-flow of air or you had some co-flowing air velocity as well? So the, the coaxial um, air blast atomizer, we have, a, we have a liquid jet, which is surrounded by an airflow, which is the coaxial airflow. And that entire assembly is actually in a wind tunnel with a very slow moving co-flow. So there are actually two co-flows. There's the main co-flow, which is actually atomizing the liquid jet. And then there's a secondary co-flow, which is just to prevent, you know, drafts in the lab and, and stuff like that from actually having a, a, an effect on, on the measurement. The alternative is to enclose the entire experiment in some sort of, you know, window or something. Um, but, you know, to be honest, even if you didn't have that co-flow or window, because these sprays have such a high Weber number, the influence would really be quite minimal. So the Reynolds number you plotted was the Reynolds number of the liquid jet, right? Yes. So you mean the verse, the wavelength versus Reynolds number? Yes, yes, exactly. That, yeah. so that, that one, yeah, I should have probably clarified. That, that, that is the liquid jet Reynolds number. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. So um, thank you very much, Aggie, once again. And thank you, everyone, who's um, participated and attended our first seminar. Um, I believe the next... Typically, these seminars will be on a Wednesday. However, I believe the next one might just be on a Thursday. Um, you'll no doubt get an email about that either through the AFMS or perhaps your institution as well. Um, but yeah, thank you all once again for participating. Thank you, Aggie, and um, we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks very much, Aggie. It was a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.